Okay. I'm not opening this morning because we want to get started, but this evening, sorry, yeah. I'm a little right now. Um, I just want to, before, Jen, Jen's going to come up and open, um, but I just wanted to say welcome everyone quickly and just kind of give a little heads up. So this is, this is how we start our services now. And we have a, it's hard to put a time frame on something like to say, hey, we're going to start at 630 because the first thing that, this is year three that we're here. So some of you are getting used to this, but the first thing that we tell people is this is not church. Okay. This isn't a church service. It's not there. There's, this isn't church. The thing that we pray the most is that this is the Holy Spirit's time. Yeah. This is his service. This is his agenda. And anything that happens is going to be as we just let him move as we let him flow. And we start service this way with our team and with people from the church and stuff. First of all, everybody's welcome. If you want to come up and pray with us, you can come up and pray with us. If you want to sit in your seat and pray, you can sit in your seat and pray. But there is, there is, there's power in what's happening. There's power in this prayer. Jesus said, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. prayer. Who's the house of God? So we should be a house of prayer. Amen. We should live in prayer. Yes. Amen? Yes. If your prayer life consists of, Father God, thank you for this meal and bless it to my body, you're missing it. Amen. Amen. Let me go one step farther. You're missing him. And trust me when I tell you, you don't want to miss him. There's going to be some things this weekend that are real. There's no sugar coating because the sugar coating days are over. The one thing that we pray that everybody sees is that the words that are spoken, that you will see that they're spoken in love. I promise you that our team loves you. I promise you, because this is what we pray every day, is that we will love people, because we pray that we will fall in love with him as he loves us. And you can't, you can't not love people when you fall in love with Jesus. Amen. That's just a byproduct of it. Hallelujah. So I just want to prepare everybody. I'm going to, I promise I'm done. I just want to prepare everybody for what's coming. This is what you're going to see. I don't know what's going to happen tonight. There, I have notes and I have, but I never use them anyway. We're, we're just going to let the Holy Spirit go. I, I'm just, I, I want to say this, that you are free to leave at any time. Nobody's going to judge you. Nobody's going to look down on you, but... The, the services are about the Holy Spirit. We may have two hours of worship before the, we even get up here to start preaching. Hallelujah. Woo! Amen. And if you're tired of that, you're and, and if you're tired, yeah, that's exactly it. Jen just said, if you're tired of that, you're not going to like heaven very much. Because <laughs> we're going to go up there and we're going to worship for eternity. Amen. So there's things that are said things nobody's trying to offend anybody but you know what if you get offended that's on you it's not on us it's not on me if you're getting offended by the word of god the problem is you yes amen hallelujah sugar coating days are over feel good services and that it's over with because we're going to preach the gospel from in to amen in its entirety. There's no, we're not going to take bits and pieces of scriptures. It's going to be how it's said in the Bible. Amen. The Bible is offensive, folks. Yes. Yeah. Yep. We need to, it's time to get the flesh under control. Amen. I'm not, I'm not trying to scare anybody away. I'm just telling that there's a preparation here. The Holy Spirit is going to move. He's here already. I felt it when I walked in the tent. I felt it when I stepped foot on the carpet here. There is an anointing in this tent. The prayers that just happened up here, as you saw people crying out and screaming out, we are storming the gates of hell for Jamestown. Amen. 
We don't live here. Some of you do. We're here to help. We're here to link arms with you. We're here to pull our swords out and storm a hill with you. We're here because the Lord has told us to come in here and break down some walls. It's time for the walls to be broken down. They're not going to be broken down from people sitting in their butt ruts on their pews and not doing anything. It's time to get up and cry out to God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm done. <laughs> I knew that was. <laughs> you know what? Some of you might have walked into the tent and gone, "Did I read the flyer right?" It said 6:30, right? But the what we're doing up here is so important every night, and it didn't start tonight. It started months ago. Our team has been praying for months. We have a. Rev- a revival prayer group that has been praying for months for you, for Jamestown. We have been praying as a group since Monday. Many of you were here every night. And as our, our brother, our good friend, Dina Frado says, the work of the church is prayer. We've been doing the work and we've gotten word after word that this is the year of breakthrough and we've been praying into that. This is the year of breakthrough and that has, the work has already started. We've been doing the work and then the ministry or the the work of the church is prayer. The reward is ministry. So now we're in the reward part. So that's what's happening now. We get to experience the reward of the work that we've already been laying down. So you, you're in the right place. You know what? The Holy Spirit brought you here for a reason. So what I've been praying is that we are open to whatever God wants us to receive. We're not going to leave this place the same way we came in. I hope you've already been affected. You know, we've already been feeling it as soon as we walked in. So that is why this up here, it is not wasted time. We have not been wasting time. This is important. That's right. It is not about time. Now, if you have littles, I do, I, I think I've gotten most everybody, but we have busy bags in the back. I understand I have two myself. And so we have little fidgets. We have things for them to do. But it's important for them to be here. We want them to be here. We love hearing them because they soak in so much more than we give them credit for. And so God is affecting their hearts no matter if they're one or if you're 101, you know, he He is, we are all here for a reason, including the kids. And so we want them here. All right. So if, if you have not met us yet, because some of you maybe haven't, I'm Jen. That was Troy that was talking first. We, we are Fervent Fire Ministries, and we came with a team. We travel all over. We've gone to North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Iowa. This year, we're going to be going down to Missouri, possibly Oklahoma. So God just told us to buy a tent and start doing tent revivals, and this is what we do. Um, it's... It sounded kind of crazy when he told us to do it, but we, we said, okay. And here we are four years later. <laughs> so God is good and he's doing amazing things. And many of you are even supporters and you know what we do. And so I want to give all of us an opportunity to sow in. You know what? When we come into an area, everything is 100% funded. We raise the funds before we come in. People have sown so that we can be here for you. And so now you get an opportunity to sow to where we're going next. And so we, what we do, well, you see a little bit of what we do, we do, but for those of you who haven't seen what Fervent Fire does even on our Saturdays, we're going to show a little video and then I will talk a tiny little bit more and then we'll get into worship. Go ahead, Chad. Oh yeah, I didn't show you how to clear that off, did I? <laughs> Sorry. It's the X. Right next to the screen. Sorry. Oh, gee whiz. Oh, this thing? Yep. So clear. Yep. And then we're going to have Are you ready, Donovan? Oh, uh, sure. For sound? Yeah. Yeah. Brian <laughs> Jennifer with Fervent Fire Ministries here in Billings, Montana. Billings, Montana. Woo! We're here in Elgin, North Dakota. We are in Montano, North Dakota. Good night, Montana! 
Jamestown, North Dakota. Jamestown. Just here in Glen Allen, North Dakota. Glen Allen. We're in Glen Underwood. Underwood, North, North Dakota. Dakota. It's here in Webster, South Dakota. Hello, Mandan, North Dakota. Great Falls, Montana. Minot, North Dakota. Decora, Iowa. Beulah, North Dakota. what you're going to see tomorrow. So we are excited for our family fun fest. We have a blast. We put up the inflatables. We do puppets every hour on the hour. And we get to give away kids Bibles. If you didn't see the numbers, because they were kind of little at the bottom, we gave away 200 or 500 the first year and over 2,000 last year. This year, it's going to be way more than that. So God has given us a huge vision for giving away 100,000 Bibles in a year. And so we are so excited that we get to partner with churches and partner with other ministries like CMA and get these Bibles into kids' hands. Last year, you also saw the Billings event, and we gave away 1,000 backpacks full of school supplies. This year, we are doing 3,000 between Bismarck and Billings. We are also giving away $2 million worth of clothing this year. God told us to love people. How do you show God's love? You feed them, you clothe them. We feed you at every service. We feed everybody on Saturdays. We're going to clothe people. We're going to give backpacks away to kids. And not only are we feeding 
physically, we feed spiritually. We are here for services. We have the Bibles we give away. And on Saturday, every hour on the hour, we shut down inflatables and we do ministry for about 15 minutes. We're going to do puppets tomorrow. I'm going to be sharing gospel illusions and sharing the gospel with families because what's the point in doing all this if we don't tell them why? If we don't show them God's love? If we don't tell them this is because of Jesus and what he did for us? That is why we do what we do. So we want to give you the opportunity to partner with what we do. This is so special for us that that you would even consider partnering. We have several of you are already monthly partners, and that is one way you can partner with us is to be a monthly giver. And I can sign you up in the back. I can show you how. It's on our website. It's pretty simple. The second way you can partner with us is to be a prayer partner. You know what? We need prayer, and I know many of you pray for us, and we appreciate that. We have prayer cards in the back that you can take with you. They're a little dated because they have Michael when he was one. We will get new pictures on there soon <laughs> with Gabby as well, but we would, we appreciate your prayer so much. Three, you can give a one-time gift. We'll take up an, an offering in a moment. You can give several different ways, um, and so we have an opportunity there for a one-time gift. And the fourth way you can partner with us is that we have some merchandise in the back and you know what for a donation of a certain amount you could get a t-shirt um, and so you can partner with us that way so monthly partner prayer partner one-time gift merchandise in the back for a donation so that is your way we're going to pray over the offering and take up the offering so um, our awesome helpers thank you dave thank you kelly we appreciate our team we can give them a hand for being here and all that they do Dave, I'm going to let you pray this time. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, to, to receive from these great folks, Lord, and just to put it to work in your kingdom. So let this offering, Lord, just do great things, Lord, throughout North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Iowa and Missouri. And we pray it all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. As you're giving, what you should know is that none of our team members including Troy or I, receive anything from the ministry. Everything that you give is used to fund the ministry. It goes towards our travel, our food, what you see here. All of this obviously takes funds. So thank you so much for your giving. We do not take it for granted, and we... We are good stewards of what is given. So thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. All right, as you are preparing your heart for worship, I want to give you this challenge. God has something for you, each and every one of you, but it's up to you if you receive it. It's not up to him. He's already here. It's up to you. So I'm going to challenge you to do something that you haven't done before. Maybe you haven't raised your hands. Maybe you haven't danced in worship. Whatever you haven't done. If you've already done those things, do that and more. Go another step. Push in. Push in closer to God. He wants to do something special for you tonight, tomorrow, this entire weekend, and he doesn't want it to stop here. So I'm encouraging you, push in. Whether that's just a surrender like this. Whether you're uninhibited and you're going to run around the tent, we are giving you freedom. <laughs> you, you are, there are no rules. You are free to worship. You're free to, to get out of your comfort zone and show him what he deserves. Give him what he deserves. We can only give him a fraction of what he deserves. But let's push in. We know that Pastor Rochelle has been preparing as well as the entire team, and they are so anointed and ready to welcome us into the presence. So I'm going to give her the mic, <laughs> so to speak. deserve mercy or we don't deserve mercy but he gives it abundantly and uh so let that be your fuel to enter in today just 
thinking of how loving and awesome he is. And God, we are so grateful. Lord, we just lift up our hearts to you right now. We set our eyes in the, on you, our affection on you, God. And we want to give you the praise and the honor that you deserve. You are worthy of all of our worship, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
the Lord. Give him the praise that he, he deserves. He will fill you up as you pour out. Walking into the stream where it's 
wherever you are, God is making you new right now. You don't have to run. You can if you want to. But you can just simply walk up into his presence. Because you are his daughter. We are his children. So if you want to receive that joy and that washing of the word, Heather's going to be here to pray. What I love about as God ministers through worship, there's a moment of breakthrough that comes. And if we move past our shyness, if we move past the hesitation in our heart, like, could God do this? He will. He will do it. My love is that the anointing is for all of creation all creation. Uh, the Lord was just, I was reading back there on the drums, and he was reminding of the, ver, uh, the first chapter of Malachi, and there's verses that as he is, um, this, it says the oracle of the word of the Lord is coming through Malachi. And if you were to read that, there's these questions and answer, this question answer format that takes place. And the first of the questions, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, for that. The first, hallelujah, the first of those questions, it says, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how and in what way have you loved us? And then the Lord begins to answer that question. And then it continues on and asks another question. And then another one. And there's these, this dialogue that takes place. And there's some of you, the Lord would not show me, but it, you are asking questions of the Lord. And the Lord is going to answer those questions, but we have to then turn our ears to, to listen to whatever he's going to share. The nation of Israel, as they are fighting to hear and wait upon the Lord, Malachi was sent to them because they had these questions, but they didn't always pause long enough to listen. And so we're going to pause long enough because maybe you're asking, Lord, why haven't you healed me yet? The Lord is going to really refresh to you about how he is our healer. Or maybe it is, Lord, maybe there's a matter that you're asking God and he's going to convict you right now. He's going to say, that is not of me, as he did with the nation of Israel, Malachi. He then judged the nation. He says, turn away from your wickedness. Whatever it is you're asking, ask God now. And he's going to show you, this is how I've loved you. This is how I've cared for you. This is how I want to deal with your sin. This is how I want to, whatever it may fill in the blank. God's going to privately do that for you. There may be one word that may come up, who knows, but I believe that for the majority, if we just close our eyes and wait, even for a moment, the Lord would say, this is what, how, why, and he will explain himself and reveal himself in ways that only he wants to speak to us, because he does not want to bring shame if he confronts. He wants to speak to you. Listen. Ask the question to the Lord now. Oh, man. So good. Do you hear his voice? <laughs> Not mine. Do you hear him?
rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be. Great among the nations and in every place incense will be offered to my name. A pure offering. O oh Lord, that our worship be that of a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. His name be exalted. Thank you, Lord, for speaking. Continue to speak, Holy Spirit.
on to you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing else. Nothing that I see. Nothing that I dream of other than you. Lord, I just want you. lay everything down that we've held dear that's not you. Let us put it down at the feet of the cross. Lord, show us the things that we've put above you so that we can lay them down at the altar to be burned up in the name of Jesus. Father God, this life is nothing without you. Everything that we are, everything that we have, everything that we do, let it be for you. Lord, I don't care about the stuff. I don't care about anything other than you. Lord, I just want you. you open people's eyes put a spotlight on the golden calves that they've raised up in front of you put a spotlight on the things that they've put above you Lord Jesus Lord that blinders are removed for these things that they will see it Lord Jesus that we will fall at your feet and worship the one that's worthy of it all. Lord, we pray that anybody that has entered this tent tonight, Lord, that our eyes will be opened. Our eyes will be opened to see you. Our eyes will be opened to see you. To see you, Lord Jesus. Lord, let us leave the things in the past. Let this be a new day. Let this be a new day of the rest of our lives and the, and the rest of eternity, Lord, as it just goes and goes and goes and goes as we focus on you in all things. Lord, that we will leave here different than we showed up in the name of Jesus. The things that we thought were important in our lives that we leave them behind. The amazing things that you've done already, Lord. The amazing things that you've done is you have stirred up the water, as Teresa said. There's a stirring in this tent. There's a stirring in this tent. There's a stirring in this tent, and it's a stirring of change. that are willing those that are obedient to take a step of faith it takes faith it takes a step of faith to step out to step out of your comfort zone to step out of of the worry of what people are thinking to step out of the whatever is going on in your mind there needs to be a loosing and a freedom of that in the name of Jesus But as you step in, as you step out and step into this stirring, God has something for you. There are chains that will be broken. There are generational curses that will be destroyed in the name of Jesus. Things that you've struggled with that you've just decided to live with, he wants to set you free. I'm telling you right now, folks, there is something going on in Jamestown. There's something going on in Jamestown. And this is the word from the Lord right here. This is what I'm hearing. 
He has something for you. There is a stirring going on, and you're not going to get it unless you step out. This isn't a moment that he's going to heal you where you sit. He's, gonna, he's not going to set you free where you sit. He wants you to step out in faith. The days of sitting back are over. We are getting close. He's coming back soon, and he's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. It is impossible to please God without faith. Impossible. That's what the Word of God says. Impossible. We can't sit back anymore. We can't sit back anymore and just expect God to do it. Without a step of faith. There is a breakthrough coming to Jamestown. There's things that have happened already. The process is moving, the ball's rolling, whatever, however you want to, whatever analogy you want to use, metaphor you want to use. There's things moving, and this is a, this is what I'm feeling. This is as we were praying up here. This is what's this is what I saw. There is a wall that's getting busted through. And the people that decide to step out and take that step of faith and say, God, I just want you. I don't care about any of this. When you take that step, you're going to be on this side. And if you don't, you're going to be left behind back here. Folks, that is real. You don't want to be left back here. The time and the age of playing church is over. There are choices and decisions that need to be made. I choose him. As for me and my house, I choose him. As for me and my house, I choose him. There are generational curses that he's ready to destroy. The crazy thing about this is it's already done. He already paid the price. He already took care of the curses. He already took care of all this. And we're the ones that choose to go, hey, I kind of want this back. I choose him. I choose victory. I choose freedom. I choose him. I just want him. I just want him. I just want him. Nothing else will do. Nothing else will do. That's a faith statement right there. Sometimes we got to get our hearts to catch up with our mouths. I do that a lot, especially when I'm pulling my foot out of there. But you know what? We, we've got to, you've got to take a step. You've got to make a declaration. Faith is speaking, right? Faith is calling things that aren't as though they are. And maybe your heart, you're going, God, how do I get there? I want to do that. I want to lay it all down for you. I want to make a decision. I want to say nothing else will do, but I'm not there. I, I, I don't know how to get there. How do I get there? Take a faith step and declare it. Speak it out. Take a faith step to do something that you don't normally do. Take a faith step. Get out of your seat. Get out of your pew, out of your butt rut. That's what I call them. Everybody sits in the same pew every single Sunday. They go to the same spot, and you got a butt rut there. I 
speak this, I, I talk about this a lot. The front of the church should never be empty. Why do we sit at the back? What are you afraid of? I'm being serious. If the anointing is up here, why are you back there? Are you afraid something's going to get, sh- a little light's going to get shined on something? Are you afraid you're going to catch on fire? I, it just, it, I don't understand it, but you know what? I've been there. Farthest burrow back I could. We, we get comfortable. We get in our ruts. Our flesh, our flesh takes over and we go, I, this is just my, this is where I'm comfortable is right here. This is where I'm comfortable is right, just right here. This is my bubble. God, you can have everything inside of my bubble. But when I'm over here, I, I can't give you this part. That's, that's not comfortable. you get to this point that you don't care about uh, you don't have a bubble pop the bubble when you pop your bubble that's when amazing things start happening because you realize that you just need him he is all we need he is all we need he is all we need we don't need our spouses as much as we need him what does the what, what does the word of god say that In comparison, we should hate everything else. We should hate our kids. We should hate our grandkids. We should hate our spouses. And even ourselves, we should hate in comparison to him. The problem is, is that we live in a world, especially in the United States, that nobody hates themselves enough. Listen to what I'm saying in comparison to him. The problem is, is that we have love affairs in this country with ourselves. We have love affairs so much that we literally have apps that are dedicated to ourselves. That we can show everybody what we're doing about our lives and how great they are and how happy we are and the the new things that we bought and this and that. We literally, it's a shrine to ourselves. That's how much we love ourselves in this country. And we will spend hours upon hours upon hours upon hours upon hours on social media, scrolling through everybody else's happy life, and then we're depressed because our neighbor got a new pickup, and they're doing this and doing that, and we're going, God, why aren't you doing anything for me? And God goes, who are you? going to stand before him someday and he's going to separate the goats from the sheep and you're either going to hear well done thou good and faithful servant or he's or you're going to hear depart from me for I never knew you the time for playing church is over when you look at that scripture in Matthew, he's, he's, Jesus is literally saying that the church, this is to the church. He's speaking to the church. This isn't to the world. People argue with me about this all the time. This is not a scripture to the world because what do they say? But Lord, he, Jesus said, not everybody who says Lord, Lord will inherit the kingdom of God. But Lord, I prophesied in your name. I I laid hands on the sick. I, 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 I. And what does Jesus say? Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, for I never knew you. Why would the world be casting demons out and laying hands on the sick? Why? That makes no sense. This is to the church. 
This is to the church. That means that there's going to be Christians, so-called, so-called, so-called Christians that are going to church that are the same ones that I hear all the time saying, well, you know what? I taught Sunday school for 25 years. I pay my tithes most of the time. I do this and I do. I, 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 I. And they're going to stand before my Lord and Savior and they're going to hear, depart from me, for I never knew you. And guess what happens after that? It's not going to be, you barely made it, but get in here. For you were lukewarm, and I spewed you out of my mouth. I vomited you out of my mouth, is what he says in Revelation. Time for playing church is over. We won't know the day or the hour, but we'll know the season. When you see these signs, look up, because I'm coming soon. The signs are here. It's all around. What just is go what is happening in Israel right now? We have an entire world that is turning on them. They don't even know why. Other than they're being ruled by the evil one. And when Christians stand up and fight for Israel and say, well, they, they will literally they almost war battle with you. What are the signs? There's earthquakes going on in places that you've never heard of before of having earthquakes. And look where they're happening. There was a huge earthquake in New York City this last year. New York City, hmm, maybe some judgment. There's some people in here right now that are sitting there going, when is, he, when is this going to be over because I'm ready to go home? This guy is not making me feel warm and fuzzy inside. I don't, I don't, I'm not really liking this whole message. Because church is supposed to be uplifting and it's supposed to make me feel good. That's your problem. And there's a wall that's getting busted through in Jamestown this weekend. And you're going to be on that side or you're going to be back there. That's the bottom line. I want to be on that side. And, it, and the crazy thing about it, the crazy thing about it is it's not even about being there or here. It's about the fact that we all need to wake up. We all need to wake up and realize why we're here in the first place. It has nothing to do with us. to do with him and as soon as you quit looking in the mirror and start looking up your life will change it's time to shatter some mirrors in here and it doesn't mean seven years of bad luck it means an eternity of you can't even put a word on what it is because happiness and joy and is not even close to what it actually is. Amen? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. We're not done yet. Because he dropped a word in to my heart, and, we're, and I'm going to preach it. And like I said before, if anybody needs to go, you're free to go. But I'm, I'm bu we're busting through some walls. God's got something for some people. There's some chains that are going to get broken tonight. I, I got it. <laughs> right now, and Teresa touched on this when she got up. But right now, and I'm, I feel like there are two monkeys on people's backs in this room. 
And some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but they know what I'm talking about, and your time is done. And I don't know where you are yet, because he hasn't shown me. But there's some people going to be set free. In the mighty name of Jesus. It's time for some monkeys to be gone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. In order to get to where we're going, whoa, there was kind of a word when we got, even spoke before we got here. I think we're good. Just so you can go take a break, too. <laughs> But be ready. <clears throat> um, kind of the word that we that has been on my heart has been. Uh, I'm just going to tell you guys. There is a absolute. I don't even know what the word is. Transformation that's happened to me over the last couple months. There's been a a freedom. There's been an eye-opening. There's been a... Uh, it, I, it's just hard to explain. I'm not who I was two months ago. I'm a completely different person than what I was two months ago, and tomorrow I'll be a completely different person than what I was tonight. That's literally how it's going. The more I'm in the Word, the more I'm with Him, the more He's pointing out things, and it hurts, and it stinks, and it's horrible, and it's, but yet it's the most amazing thing ever. As, I, as I've literally have prayed, it's like praying for patience. A couple years ago, I prayed for patience. Lord, I'm going to pray for patience. If you're not ready for that, don't pray for that. It was like a year after Jen and I got married, and I'm like, I got to pray for patience because I was, and it, oh my goodness, it was a long year. It was a very long year. I couldn't wait till it was over. <laughs> Get that patience year? Okay. okay. So, but that's kind of how it's been this year is that I've been, especially the last couple months, <clears throat> there's been a, just this prayer of going, okay, Lord, I, I want more. That's literally been the prayers. I want more of you. I just want you. I want more of you. And I don't care what the cost is. I don't care what. I just, I, I want to get there. I don't, want, I don't want my life the way that it was. In, in looking from the outside and from my flesh, my life is wonderful compared to what it was. I have an amazing wife. I have two little cute little kids that I just love that crack me up. But that's not where my, that's not where my happiness is. That's not where my, that's where my, sorry, let me, that's, my happiness is there, but that's not where my joy is. I love them. They make me happy. But by comparison, it's nothing. It's nothing compared to him. And what he's showing me as I, as I step into this is that there is so much junk in my life. There's so much in my life that I have put above him. There's so many. I didn't even realize there could be this many golden calves. And what's amazing is that I'll talk to people, shoot, I've, let, myself. Oh man, I'm so good. I've never been closer to God than I am right now. And, you know, I, I'm good. When you start praying for a refining, when you start praying for more, Lord, I want you to shine a spotlight on anything in my life. When you pray for that, when you pray to be refined and let the impurities come to the top, they'll start coming to the top. And then you got to start dealing with stuff that you didn't realize was there. Deep-rooted, I mean, we're talking foundational things in your life. 
and they and it starts coming to the top and then pretty soon he'll you start skimming off those impurities he starts skimming off those impurities and then the the hotter it gets the more impurities come up and the and the crazier that they are because they're attached But the word that I've, that he's given me, the, the focus of all of this, how do you, you know, the question of, Lord, how do I get there? I want to be like this. I want more of you. I want a desire. I don't, some people don't even have that. They literally have prayed, Lord, I want a desire to want you because I don't have one. I know that I want it, but it's not there. Like, I mean, I'm just like, whatever. God, I love you, but I don't, like, love you. How do you get there? Get back to the basics. What are the basics? What's the foundation of who, of, of everything that we believe, of everything that we do, is Jesus. Amen. Right? How do you fall in love with Jesus? You get to know Jesus. How do you get to know Jesus? Get into the Word of God. Amen. Amen. You ask for it. You say, Lord, I'm going to start reading this, and I want to know you more. Open my eyes up to see some things that I've never seen before. Open my heart up to hear this. Let's, let's go to John 19. Nope, let's go to John 18. I'm going to read some word tonight. Is that okay? Yeah. I'm going to read out of the New King James. We're going to kind of paint a picture here. I don't know if any of you have heard this or not, but there was a guy named Jesus. He was, he was born a few thousand years ago, a couple thousand years ago. And he just happened to be the son of God. Birth of a virgin. Does, it, does anybody, is anybody going, who, who's Jesus? Anybody? Okay, so we're, we're all good in here. I, I need to see how far I need to go back. <clears throat> so here's Jesus, lives 33 and a half years, walks the earth, never sinned perfect life lived a perfect life now I, I let's let's paint let's paint this picture a little bit that means that jesus was a two-year-old that never sinned he was a three-year-old that never sinned he was a four-year-old i have a four-year-old boy right now and i would take half of that because he's four how can you see a little kid, a two-year-old little kid, what do they call it, the terrible twos, right? How do you have a two-year-old kid that is so disobedient and then you deny the fact that we are born into a sinful nature? When the parents are going, how did you even learn this? It's because we're born into flesh. Because years ago... God said, you can do anything you want, but don't do this. And man said, I'm going to do it anyway. Right? right. Yeah. And that started a roller coaster, a downward spiral of the human race and everything else. The very people that God created in their own image that we, have, that we were born into this sinful nature and we have flesh now that we have to deal with for a while. But God said, this isn't working. We need to figure out, we, we got to do something here, right? We got to fix this. We got to fix this because there, there's, I just love these people so much. I love them so much that we got to fix this. So he said, you know what? I'm going to send my son, my only son. I'm going to send him to the earth. He's going to live a perfect life because I, I require a sacrifice. 
Right now, the word around, the word in the, in the world right now is that, oh, we serve a God of grace. And you can do whatever you want to because the, the grace of God has you covered. Cheap grace. That's right. To that I say, you don't understand the grace of God. Amen? Amen. So, he sends his son down, lives a perfect life, and he said, son, here's what's going to happen. You're going to sacrifice yourself for all of them. And this is going to, we love them so much. This is the only way to take care of this because there's not a man alive or woman alive that can do what you're about to do. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. Except for one. Amen? So, back to the two-year-old not sinning that still blows my mind. <laughs> to have a little kid. He never sinned. Ever. A perfect perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice. So here's Jesus, 33 and a half years, walks the earth, goes out, says, it's time to get my disciples. I'm going to bring these guys together. They're going to travel with me on the road. I'm going to show them how to do things. We're going to teach them how to love God, how much God loves them. They're going to lay hands on the sick. They're going to recover. They're going to cast demons out. They're going to do all of these things that I'm doing. But one of them's going to betray me. But this has to be done to get to where we need to go. Because here's where we are now, and we need to get over here. Now, the crazy thing is, when you think about Judas, is Jesus is God, right? He's fully God. He's fully man, but he's fully God. He's got the Holy Spirit in its, complete, in its entirety. So he knows exactly what's going to happen with Judas. He was there when Judas was created. So he knows what's going to happen. So here's Jesus going, okay, let's... It's time. The, the father says, okay, all right, son, it's time. So they go to the garden. They're all sitting there. Jesus says, I want you all to pray. You guys pray. Pray, because this is about to happen. So pray. He goes off by himself. Now this proves... This proves, I've talked with people, I've had the arguments with people about this, that they're like, yeah, but, you know, all of the things that Jesus did, yeah, but he was God. Yeah, he was God. This proves the humanity of Jesus. It proves the humanity of Jesus that Jesus cries out in the garden and he says, I'm going to paraphrase this in my, he says, Dad, I really don't want to do this is basically what he's saying. If there's any other way to do this, let's do that. But it's not my will. That's what he says, right? Not my will, but thy will be done. So Jesus, so when, when, when people tell me, well, he was, yeah, but he was God. So you're saying that God, that's the God side of Jesus, is saying, hey, I don't want to do this. He basically is arguing with himself. Right? If this is Jesus is fully God, he's basically saying, I don't want to do this. Well, I know, but yeah, okay. He's talking to him. No, this is his flesh. His flesh as a human being on the earth is saying, Dad, I know what's about to happen. <laughs> and if there's any other way of doing this, let's do that. But... It's not about me, it's about you. Did you hear what I just said? It's not about me, it's about you. It's not about me, it's about you. Jesus, the Son of God, separates himself 
This wasn't an easy prayer either. He wasn't having an easy time. He wasn't going, oh, let's go get this over with. He was sweating blood. He literally had blood coming out of his pores because this was such a battle with his flesh. He was going, okay, I, I got, this is, oh my goodness, we got to do this. I know I, know I have to do it because it's the will of the Father. And it's not about me, it's about him. So I know I got to do this, but I need to be prayed up. I need to be focused on the Father. I need to be here. I've got to be here and not here. Multiple times, right? When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops, if you look into this, a detachment of troops was about 300 men. Now, I don't know if they had all 300 of them, but that's like 300 men. 300 men came to get a rabbi. The officers from the chief priests and Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now, when he said to them, I am he... They drew back and fell to the ground. How many people have caught that before? Not very many, I'm, I'm just saying. Jesus said, that just gave me God bumps even when I just said that. He said, I am he, and what happened? The first baptisms of the Holy Spirit. That was the power of God hit him. The troops literally went, whoa, and fell over. I am he. Okay? Then he, then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he, therefore if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be filled which he spoke. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. I always wondered why they... For some reason, we know who his, what his name is, but it's, it was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? There's so many, there are so many messages like right here. Because if you remember a chapter back, he said, go, he said we need, you need to get swords. Sell everything you own and get a sword. And they said... They went back, they left, they came back, and we, we have two of them. And he said, that's enough. Once again, I've heard people talk about this saying that, that was, they were, he was literally saying, telling them to go get a sword. This pretty much says that's not the, that, him saying two is enough was basically him going, yeah, that's enough. Because they missed it. How long do I have to be here? Because yeah. if it was really for the swords, then why would, he, why would he have told him to go get swords if it was real swords he was talking about? Why would he have told him to go get swords and when Peter acted, then he was like, put that away. Right. What are you doing? Are you, Peter, <laughs> do I need to say it again? Get thee behind me. Should I not drink the cup? Right? right? right. right. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not dogging on Peter. Yeah. I'm just saying, because all of them were the exact same way, because none of them got it either, because all of them were like, well, we got two swords. We're get ready to go. All right, so let's fast forward. We know, oops, 
We know that he goes in before the high priest. He goes... Uh, stands before Pilate. He, the, the, everybody knows the story of what happened now. Peter denies him three times. But I want to start here with... I'm going to read with uh, 19 verse 5. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Now this is after Pilate had made the decision. Pilate's own wife said, Don't have anything to do with this guy. Pilate was not innocent. He knew he wasn't supposed to. He, sa- he kept telling these people, hey, I, I don't find anything wrong with him. There's no, there's no reason to do what you guys are saying to do. I'm going to let him go. And the crowd was going, no, we want justice or whatever. Does that sound familiar? I'm not comparing anybody to anybody. I'm saying, look at what happens with the crowd. Yeah. Right? So Pilate finally, Pilate's wife comes out and says, I had a dream last night. This is horrible. You don't want to do this. Just let him go. And yet Pilate caved to the crowd. Caved to the crowd. Well, I'll just take him out back. We'll whip him. And then I'll let him go. Because if they see, if they see what I've done to him, then they'll, then he was trying to appease the crowd. So they take Jesus out and they flog him. And we all know the story. Most of us have seen Passion of the Christ, which probably is still not even as close to what actually happened. And I went to that movie twice at the theater and there was not one person... I've never been to a movie ever before or after that there was complete silence through an entire movie. That there was complete silence when the movie was over, that people sat in their seats for minutes because they couldn't get up. And as people walked out, there was no laughing, there was no, hey, should we go get something to eat? It was silence. All you could hear in that theater was, it's <sighs> all you could hear. Because there was a visual to something that we've all heard the story of, and that visual still wasn't even what it, what it, how it actually happened. Because I, we can't comprehend it. Hollywood can't make it up. He was unrecognizable as a man. And I could tell that that was a man. Unrecognizable as a man. Now, mind you, let's keep this in mind now. At any point... At any point, Jesus could have said, Dad, I changed my mind. Because look at what they're doing to me right now. These are the people we're doing this for. And look at what they're doing to me right now. Just, let's just kill them. This was planned before time began all of god knows everything he's omniscient jesus was there when they created man all they they all knew that this was going to happen but yet jesus just just a little bit before this what did he do god if there's dad if there's any other way let's do that but not my will but your will be done not my will but your will So Jesus comes out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him. Crucify him. So what Pilate thought was going to happen was that he's going to, they're going to beat this guy up, he's going to come out, and the people are going to see this and go, Oh my goodness, I can't, look, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And then they're going to let him go. But what happened instead was, let's, let's go back here, let's look at this. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, this does not say the crowd. 
This doesn't say the world. This says the chief priests and officers. That means it's the church, folks. Did you hear what I just said? This is the church that said, crucify him. Kill that guy. The church. Not the world. The church. Not the world. Let that sink in. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of God. Do you hear me? Is that getting through? Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Washes his hands. Pilate could have let him go. Pilate didn't have to whip him. The Jews answered, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the son of God. How many people in the church right now would have Jesus standing right in front of them and they were, they're so focused on their own lives, they're so focused on the law, they're so focused on their religion or whatever else that he could be standing right here in front of them and they'd say, he ought to die. He called himself the son of God. As he, was, as he was performing miracles that nobody had ever seen in their lives, in the history of the world, as he's literally, literally, prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. He's walking this out. And they are so blinded by their religion that they can't see him standing right in front of them. How many golden calves are there that it's religious? How dare you take that communion table out of our church? How dare you get rid of the pews? How can anybody serve Jesus if we're not sitting on pews? The sad thing is, folks, I've literally heard these conversations. I would like somebody to flip open their Bible and show me where it says, Thou shall not go to heaven unless, you sit, unless ye sit on a pew. It's not in there. You know what it says? You have to know him. And he has to know you. It's hard to know him if you never get out of your butt rut and come up to an altar. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was that more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. the one who delivered me to you. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Once again, remember who this is. This is the church. Let's go down to verse 17. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, 
where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the, of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers knew that they had crucified Jesus, took his garments, and made four parts to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without, was without seam, woven in the top and one in, in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it, who's it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. I'm reading a PG version of this in John. So Jesus says, this is my mother, tells John, this is your mother now. It is finished. After, so down to verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a hyssop, and put it into his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Maybe I should have went with another version, but we all know what it is. If you don't, I'll give you some scriptures and we can talk about it afterwards. But the, the point of this is that we've got to get back to the basics of realizing what that cross represented. We've got to get to the, to the, we got to get past ourselves and realize that what Jesus did on that day and the 33 and a half years going up to that, what he did was for us. And instead of turning that back onto him and saying, God, you are so worthy, we, we make it about us. Everything's about us. Who in here has heard of the Meridians? So there's a story of two Meridian, they were basically teenagers. That there was an English slave owner that had an island that was farming, whatever, it, what, I don't know, it doesn't say what all he, the, I don't know what all he did, but it was a slave island. He had slaves on there. And this man had turned his back on God and basically said, there will be no Jesus spoke about on this island. And even if a missionary or somebody shipwrecks on here, I'm going to keep them completely separated over here so that none of my slaves ever hear about Jesus until they're rescued and then I'll send them back. So here's these two Meridian teenage boys. Teen, two teenage boys, two Meridian teenage boys that, say, that, that are so in love with Jesus. They are so focused on him and not themselves. They're saying, it's not about me, God, it's about you. They're so focused on this. They're so in love with him that they said, you know what? I, I, I don't know the exact, I'm just, I'm giving some color here, okay? They sat there and they said, you know what we should do? There's this island over here and there's all these people that are never going to hear about Jesus and that, we can't let that happen. So let's go to this slave owner and we'll sell ourselves to him. This slave, once you became, once you went to this island, you never came home. So they sold, their sel they sold themselves into slavery, okay? The slave owner made them pay their own way. So basically he said, here's some money for you selling yourself into slavery, now give it back because you have to pay for your ship for the to get yourself there. Okay. 
Wrap your head around this for a second. Think about this for a second. Two teenage boys knowing full well that they would never see their family again. They would never, they would never get married. They would never have kids. They would, they would never do anything unless the slave owner said, you can do this. They're going to work the rest of their lives. They're never going to get paid. They're never going to get to buy a new pickup or a boat or anything. There's, there's never going to be any of that. Ever. And they said, he is worthy of this. So they're literally saying goodbye to their family. You can look this up. This is a true story. They're literally saying goodbye to their family. They're telling their family goodbye forever. Mom, Dad, I love you. I'm not ever going to see you again, but we'll see you up there. They're saying bye to their family forever to go into slavery so that they can tell the slaves about Jesus. And as they get on the ship, this is documented, they're on the ship and they link arms as the boat is pulling away from the harbor. This <laughs> the last words that the family heard from these young men as they're pulling, as the ship is sailing away, these young boys yelled out, let the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Let the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. It cha this, this has changed my life. Jesus has changed my life. A week ago, two missionaries in Haiti, knowing the danger, The State Department months ago said, get out of Haiti to everybody. Not just America, like everybody, like get out of Haiti. And there was a young couple that were running an orphanage in Haiti. And they were warned that they're coming after the orphanage. Their gang's coming. And both of them said, we're here for the children because this is where God has us. We got word from missionary friends in the, 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 the night that it happened that the gangs broke in, infiltrated the orphanage, and there was prayer circle. People were reaching out all over the place saying, pray, 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 pray. There's missionaries. The gains have broken in. They want to kill them. There's, they don't care about people. Pray, 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 pray. About 4.30 the next morning, I got a text message that said that they were both killed. This happened a week, a week, less than a week ago, I think. It's probably a week ago now. What this couple said was, let the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his sacrifice. Because it's not about me, it's about him. This message need to be brought, needed to be brought tonight so that there can be a realization in all of us 
a realization that this life is not about us. It's not about you, it's about him. We will come to revival meetings so that we can get healed. Instead of coming to a revival meeting because maybe he's worthy of it. Maybe I can get together with a bunch of other believers and we can link arms and we can see what, who needs prayed for. We go to church so that we can receive instead of going church to church to, to give. It's all about us. I want you to think about this for a second. The fire, hell, brimstone message, there's nothing wrong with that. But this is the realization that I had just, just a short time ago. That preaching fire, br hell, brimstone, you need to get saved so that you don't go to hell is a selfish message. You know why? Because it makes what Christ did on the cross about you instead of him. Think about that. Salvation is not about you. It's about him. Because he deserves a reward for his sacrifice. We are that reward. He did it for us. Not so that we could take that and go, this is about me. Me, 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 me. We have been called to love. What did Jesus say? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, and all thy soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. We seem to forget that part of it. God, I love you so much. Son, I want you to go to your neighbor and just tell him about me. Yeah, but that makes me uncomfortable. What if, they, what if they make fun of me? What if they say, I don't want to hear any of that Jesus stuff. Yeah. Daughter, I want you to tell your boss about Jesus. What if I get fired? Right. Son, I want you to go on a missions trip. Yeah, you know what? I don't want to do that because I, maybe they don't have good bathrooms. I can't go to the bathroom in a hole. Daughter, there's a prayer service every Wednesday night. I want you to start going to that. Yeah, but that's the night my favorite show is on. Son, I want you to start teaching Sunday school because I want you to start sowing into these young people's lives. Yeah, but in the summertime, I like to go to the lake every Sunday. Yeah. That might get in the way of if I, want to decide, if I decide I want to go do something. Yeah. Yeah. Son, daughter, I want you to go to the pastors and tell them I'm here to do whatever you need me to do. Yeah, but... That could be a lot. Yeah. What if I have to give up every Sunday for the next year? And what happens if my favorite football team makes it to the Super Bowl? <laughs> you see the pattern here? Yep. And the sad thing is, is that this is the reality of the church right now. If there's anybody in here right now saying, that's not me, let's sit down for five minutes and talk about your life, and I guarantee we can point some things out. Right. And it's not about that. I'm not say what I'm saying is, is that this is all of us. Because is there a single person in this room right now that is ready to sell yourself into slavery so that you can go to an island to make sure that these people hear about Jesus? Raise your hand if you're willing to. Because I promise you that we can send you some places with some missionaries that you don't want to go and you'll change your mind. Careful. I'm just saying, be careful. I hope you're right. Amen. We've got to get there. Right? 
We got to get to that point. We got to get to a point that it's not about this. It's about him. That we're ready to give it all up for him. This life is this long. There's an eternity that follows after this. What we just read about with Jesus, and again, I'd love to go way deep into this. I'd love to go into this. I'd, I'd love to play the last few scenes of Passion of the Christ just so that we can see this, but it's not about an emotional reaction. It can't be about that. It's not about our emotions. It's about our heart. It's about what we're, where our focus is. Where are we putting, where are our, our jewels? Where's our gold? Where's our treasure? Yeah. I told everybody at the beginning, there's going to be some real things that happen right now, but we have to get, we have to, we have to realize that there, this is an issue here. We have to realize that maybe, maybe I'm not as well as I thought I was. Maybe things aren't as good as what they are. I used to give altar calls, like trying to get people to admit that, hey, I, I could be a little closer to God. And I thought, I, was, I thought that was the right thing to do. Like, hey, wake up, wake up. Maybe you could be a little closer and admit, just admit it. That's not what it's about. All of us and the people that sat in their seats while there was altar calls going on and 99% of the people, I would sit there and go, really? So you're saying you've arrived. You're there. Because now I know that you're not because you just lied. Because unless you're Jesus, you're not there. Lord, let me not ever, let me not ever get to a point that I don't think that I can get closer to you. Yeah. Ever, 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 ever. Amen? Amen. There's got to be eyes opened. There's got to be blinders removed, earplugs pulled out, hearts softened, walls ripped out around us, veils tore out that we've put up. Religion has to be tore down. Pride has to be tore down. Selfishness needs to be tore down. Not to mention the, the sins that we all, that the church is so good at pointing out. Well, you look at pornography, you're going to hell. There is a lot more at stake here. There are people dying every single day that are going to hell, including in churches. That's the reality of it. Once saved, always saved is a myth. If there's any Baptists in here, I'm sorry, but we can go through the scriptures and I can show you. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of God. We already talked about that. That kind of shoots that out of the water. I'm sorry, but it does because that scripture is written to the church. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to bu burst of any bubbles, but the bubbles need to be burst. We need to, we need to realize that we're here for a reason. We need to realize that God has called us. Everybody is called. The great commission is to everybody. It is not to ministers. It's not to the pastors. It's not to the uh, apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers. And it's, that's, it's to them, but it's to everybody. He didn't say in Matthew, in Matthew, he doesn't say, well, you know what? If you're called into the five-fold ministry and full-time ministry, I want you to go into the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples of them. He, this, was a, this was to everybody. This was to all of us. He says in Mark, these attesting signs shall follow those that believe. These attesting signs shall follow those that believe. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. They'll cast demons out. When was the last time somebody cast a demon out in here? 
I'm not saying there's people that have done it. I'm saying, is it is this a daily thing? Is this a weekly thing? When was the last time that you laid hands on somebody and the power of God shot through your hands and you saw a leg grow out? When was the last time that you were willing in the middle of Walmart as the Holy Spirit put it on you that there was somebody rolling by in a wheelchair that said, can I pray for you? Now, this is the crazy part. Jesus said, these attesting signs shall follow those that believe. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Why are we not praying for everybody? Why do we have hospitals full of people? I'm just saying. Why do we have people running around with demons? If you don't think there's people that are possessed with demons in the United States and in Jamestown, you're wrong. Probably people that you know. People that you see every day. People that you call your friends. People, it's probably people you interact with on a daily basis. And they got a monkey on their back. For those of you who were listening when I said that earlier, a monkey on a back is not necessarily somebody that is actually possessed by a demon, but they're oppressed, which really, when we break it down, is the same thing. Yeah. You're being controlled by a demon. And we, as the church, who are so loving... We let, it, we let it happen. Some of us that are in the church that are so loving are the ones that have the monkeys on their back. Yeah. Yeah. This, is a, this is a reality. I wish we could go into some churches and I could show you. I'm not sure where we're going the next two days because it's up to him. But this needed to happen tonight. This needs to happen everywhere. This needs to be a message that is re-preached all across the world, all around the world, because we as the church have forgotten what we're here for. We as the church have forgotten what we're supposed to be, who we're supposed to be worshiping, who, and it's not the person in the mirror. It's the person that died on the cross for us. It's the person that laid his life down for us. It's the person that took the sin of mankind that ever have happened or will happen ever again, and he took them upon himself for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And we are so thankful of it that we make our lives about us. Because he did it for us, right? See what I'm saying here? This isn't a... How do I say this the right way? This isn't about an altar call to come up. Because if all you're going to do is come up on an altar call to, you know, you feel, I'm feeling a little fuzzy inside right now and I need to, I'm going to come up and do my good deed for the day and then I'm going to go home and go back to my life and how it was, then don't come up. Rochelle, can you come up please and play? Please, please and thank you. Dave, can you grab this please? My, my tablet's on there. There are, there are things that are going on right now. There's things that are going on right here. There's things that are progressing. There's, there's plans that God has in place. I, t I, I said it early. We've been praying about this for months. The word that we got about even praying about coming back to Jamestown for the third year. The word that the Lord gave us was that there is a breakthrough that's going to happen in Jamestown. 
I believe it because that's what he said. And it's been confirmed. There's a breakthrough that's going to happen in Jamestown. That's God's plan. That's what he's got in motion already. This was planned out before time began, before any of us were even anything. Jen said this at the beginning. God has something for everybody here. He's got something, but it's up to you whether you want to receive it. There is faith that needs to happen. There's things that need to happen, but what I'm saying is this is not, I don't care if we have one person come forward or, no, or, or all of you come forward. If it's not, if it's not going to be something that's real. You see what I'm saying? Don't respond to an emotional thing. I'm not a missionary up here saying, oh, hey, look at all these people and all of this, and I'm just, I'm going to make you feel good and, or make you feel bad about yourself so that you do that. That's not what the purpose of this message is. The purpose of this message is that you open your eyes to see that you're looking in a mirror, and that's what it's about. See what I'm saying? What I'm saying is, is it's time to break the mirrors. It's time to get rid of that mirror. Throw it out the window because it doesn't matter. And it's time to look up. We've got to stop playing church. We have to stop playing church. We're not here to play church. We're not here so that you can go to church every Sunday and feel good about yourselves and check off your list. Well, went to church today. That's not what life is about. Life is not about you. Life is about who's out there. Life is about him. And he's called us to go out there and reach out to them. He has called us to sell ourselves into slavery because there's people there that don't have a chance about hearing about Jesus. That's the reality of where we're at. He's coming back soon. He's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. And either you're going to be ready, either your oil, your lampstands are going to be full or they're not. You're either going to be on that side of the wall or you're going to be on this side of the wall. You're either going to be a sheep or you're going to be a goat. You're either going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, or you're going to hear, depart from me, for I never knew you. There's only one way to be safe. There's only one way to know where you're going. One way. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. He's the only way to the Father. And as we sit here tonight, I know you guys are cold. Thank you for those of you, you know, for staying. This has been a, most people aren't used to services that go this long. But we should be, right? We should be used to coming in and worshiping the Lord for three or four or five or ten hours. We should be used to going, I don't even have a watch on. The only reason I'm wearing one is so I know what day of the week it is. Amen? We've got to get there. We've got to make it about him. We've got to lay down these golden calves. We've, they need to be put on the altar and burned up. That's what we prayed earlier tonight. That's what I'm praying right now. This isn't about, we're going to pray for people that need prayed for. If that's all you came for was to get prayed for, we'll pray for you. And God will heal you. But you're missing out on something bigger. You're missing out on something huge. If that's all you came for. And if that's all you're thinking about. We're going to open up the altars. If you need prayer for something, we'll pray for you. If you need, uh, I'm not even dogging up. If you need prayer for healing, we want to pray for you. <laughs> Don't be afraid to ask for prayer for healing because of what I just said. That's not what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that this is bigger. There's something bigger going on. God's got something bigger going on in Jamestown. God's got something bigger going on in this tent right now. 
There's eternity talk happening right now. There's forever and ever and ever and ever decisions. There's things going on right now that are going to change the very course of your life and everybody around you. Did you hear what I just said? Everybody around you, there's a ripple effect that happens when you give it all to God. There's a ripple effect because when you begin to fall in love with him, you can't keep your mouth shut about him. And everybody you meet, you begin to tell about Jesus. You don't have to know, you don't have to have a master's degree in theology. You need to have a master's degree in Jesus. You just got to tell people about him. You just got to share your testimony with people. When it becomes about him and not about you, that's what happens. Okay, I'm done. Um, tomorrow, we're going to open the altars up, but I want to say this so that as people come up and they get going, I'm not, I don't want to disrupt what's happening. There is an anointing up here. You can feel it when you're standing up here. It's been all night long when I walked in the tent tonight. God wants to set some people free. He wants to heal some people. There's chains that need to be broken. There's monkeys that need to be taken off of backs. And it's a simple procedure. And it starts with a step. Tomorrow, 10 to 2, we'll be right out here. My favorite part of the weekend... If you're volunteering tomorrow, please try to be here at 8 o'clock. We're setting inflatables up out there. We're going to have ministry right in here. As Jen said, every hour on the hour, we shut everything down, and we bring everybody into this tent. She does 15 minutes of ministry, and it's a basic message of Christ. And every single time we do one, there are kids and adults with their hands in the air for Jesus. We're going to give as many Bibles away to kids as we can. We're going to pray for kids to get filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray for people to be healed. We're going to pray for people for whatever they need. And it's fun. And then back again tomorrow night, 5 o'clock food, 6.30-ish service. 6.30 is when we start prayer. We start a little bit before that, but... And then Sunday morning at 10. So... I, I love you guys. Everybody here. I haven't even talked to all of you, and I love you. I do. That's, that's, the, that's the God's honest truth. I hope I have a chance to visit with everybody and talk to everybody at some point, maybe tonight, whenever, but I want to open this up. If, you, if you're ready, if you're saying, God, this is me, I, we don't have to pray with everybody. We don't, this isn't about that. This is about a decision that you're making as a person. You're making to say, you know what, this is a, a submission. This is a God. This is me. And I, and I don't want to look in the mirror anymore. I want to look up at you. And you come up and make it about him. It's not about the evangelist. It's not about anything else other than him.